Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My two guests today are Patrick Miller and Keith Simon, co-authors of the recently released book, Truth Over Tribe, Pledging Allegiance to the Lamb, Not the Donkey or the Elephant. And uh, Patrick and Keith also co-host a really fantastic podcast that I've been just gobbling up recently. It's called Truth Over Tribe, same title as the book. And we had a wonderful conversation uh, about a Christian political identity um, these two guys are awesome. Yeah, if, if you like Theology and Raw, you're going to absolutely love uh, uh, Patrick and Keith. And I definitely uh, would encourage you to uh, both pick up their book and uh, go listen to their podcast, Truth of a Tribe. It's really fantastic. So please welcome to the show for the first time, Patrick and Keith. I am so excited about this podcast uh, conversation. Um, I'm getting to know, uh, we're getting to know each other a little bit by two new friends. I'm just going to call you friends because <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it's going to be a pretty... Uh, a pretty sure case that we're going to be friends after this interview. Uh, Patrick and Keith, thanks so much for coming on Theology and Raw. Well, we're glad to be here. I have been a big uh, fan of your podcast, read a bunch of your books, and excited to hang out with you for a while. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's it's extremely mutual. And you guys got a really sexy studio over there and a really nice <laughs> mic. So this is, uh, this is like a joint podcast. And I have been absolutely loving your your podcast. Like, I just, I love... Well, you even said offline, and I've said it many times that you know Jesus is nonpartisan, but he's very he is political. Like mm. the the idea that you know as Christians oh, don't don't get political, don't get political. It's like no, the gospel is a political proclamation that Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. That created lots of political waves in the first century. Um, so yeah, I, I don't like the language of like Jesus isn't political, but he's certainly not partisan. Um, can you I, can you just I don't know, whoever wants to start tell your story and how specifically like how you came to understand the need for this <laughs> to address tribalism in, in the church. Is this kind of a recent thing or something that has always kind of been on your guys' hearts? Well, I, I'm the young one in this group, so I'm going to defer to my elder here and let him <laughs> tell Stop. the story. <laughs> Stop. So, you know, it's interesting because we've all gotten caught up into tribalism one way or the other. I remember, and this is a long time ago, but I remember the 1992 election. I just become a Christian in college and uh, I'm sitting in the backyard of a friend. We're watching the political returns come in. This is back when Newt Gingrich and that crew was trying to uh, take back uh, uh, Congress from the Democrats. And when they declared that the Republicans, re and when they had declared the Republicans had won, I run around the backyard, whooping and hollering with my shirt <laughs> off, waving it over my head. He wasn't even drunk. I mean, that's the crazy <laughs> part. He's yeah, a sober. totally sober guy. <laughs> and and. It, you know, that, that was a long time ago, but it captures this idea that I had fallen into that yeah. if Christians could just get the right people elected, yeah. then everything was going to be OK. That the main problem with the world is that one party wasn't in power. And if we yeah. could reverse that, all of our problems would be solved. And so all of us get sucked up in to this kind of tribalistic, political, partisan way of thinking. Absolutely. I mean, just like Keith, I am a recovering tribalist. I have a similar story, although my shirt stayed on the entire time. In 2008, I was in college. Barack Obama came to speak at my university because back then our state was actually still a swing state. It's not <laughs> anymore. And uh, I remember hearing his message, hope, and that he wanted to you know, care for the marginalized and the oppressed and the poor. And it, and it was electrifying to me as a Christian who saw those as values that I shared with him. And again, when he won, I was so excited. You know, finally, with the Democrat in charge, we were going to change this country. And of course, reality will, will wake you up. A lot of things that I thought were going to change did not change in the successive years. But I think for both of us, it was because of our relationship with Jesus that we began to realize that we had uh, our, our loves, our allegiances in the wrong order. Mm -hmm. We were putting a party first, and we really need to get Jesus into that first spot. Because like you just said, Jesus does have a politic, uh, but he's not partisan. And there isn't a party that is perfectly aligned with his kingdom. His kingdom. In fact, I, I'd say it's kind of hope naive on some level to expect that any human institution or group or party is going to approximate the ethics of a transcendent king who created everything. So wait, so you came from a strong Democratic Democrat background and you were, came from more Republicans? So you guys came from different tribes in, out of your tribalism? Yeah, that, that, yeah, essentially that's true. 
uh, Patrick being younger, a different generation. And, you know, some of us are we're just shaped by our experiences, mm-hmm. but I would definitely say that for most of my life, I leaned on the right. And I might still kind of think that way to some extent. It's not a matter of saying people can't be a Republican or Democrat or run for office or work on a campaign. I mean, I think all those things can be really good things. The problem comes when you allow those political allegiances to take the top priority in your life and you give them your loyalty. Now, all of a sudden you start falling into us versus them thinking, you know, paint people as the bad guys, you demonize your opponents, you start to lie or manipulate uh, facts in order to advance your agenda. You're unwilling to critique your own side. And and that's the tribalism we're trying to push back on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've often said like, of course, people are going to resonate with certain values that are at least um, talked about. (laughs) I don't even want to say embraced, but in my more cynical moments, I would say the values that might be promoted for the sake of gaining power. (laughs) That's That's a more cynical way of putting it. Like, you know, do people on the left really care about race? Maybe. Or are they using that conversation in a way that can gain a bigger power base? I'm going to plead the fifth on that. I don't know people's hearts, you know, do people on the right really care about, you know, life of the unborn? Yeah, maybe, maybe they do. They they probably, I'm sure some at least do, you know, Um, but I don't know. I I feel like in the last couple of years, it's, it's been so manifested that the, the, at least the, the, the leaders at the top on, on these different sides are in part like just really grasping after power which is which is what political leaders are going to do like this isn't anything new and, that, and that's where you i mean you even said it like once you start aligning with a tribe rather than saying oh these values that are talked about i resonate with that that i'm not sure about that i think i might be over here on this one on this um but once you align with a side all of a sudden especially in the last few years that side has made the other side their enemy and they will do whatever it takes to stamp out their enemy. It's like, well, Christians cannot like be a part of that. That's just not helpful. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's funny because polarization on one level is nothing new in the United States. I mean, we had a civil war in the past. And so, you know, so people talk about this moment as though this has never happened before. And I think, well, no, it has. And this goes all the way even back to, to the founding of our country. I, I'll read this little political ad <laughs> from when uh, Thomas Jefferson was running against uh, uh, Adams. And the stuff they said about each other was hilarious. This is what Jefferson's people called Adams. They said he was a bald, blind, crippled, toothless man who wanted to start a war with France. And and, and then and then in, in response, uh, th- this is what was said about Jefferson, that if he got elected, murder, robbery, rape, adultery and incest will be openly taught and practiced. Oh the air will be rent yeah. with this. <laughs> the air will be rent with the cries of the distress. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crime. <laughs> oh, my God. OK. <laughs> you know, so I'm one of those like, look, polarization is nothing new. But I think you hit on something that that is new. Yes. I mean, hi- history echoes history rhymes. But we're, this is a slant rhyme right now, what we're going through, because back in Jefferson and Adams day, there was an argument over capital T truth. What okay. is the truth? And now we've we've entered this relativistic moment where we're arguing over whose truth is the truth, yeah. which which truth gets to be in control. And when and when you can't agree on fundamental facts like two plus two equals four, and I can tell you stories about people who've disagreed with me about the fact that two plus two equals four, you, you, you can't build consensus, you can't yeah. build brick. So then all that ends up mattering is what you just said: it's power. It's yeah. whoever has the power to to exert control, to have, you know, pull the levers in society. Those are the ones who get to make the decisions. And so you can't have consensus. You can't admit when you're wrong. You can't have a dialogue because we, we don't even agree that there's such a thing as shared truth that all of us can, you know, c- come together around. Yeah. Yeah. And now I feel like the other, and I've said this several times on the podcast, but, and, and I, you know, I'm, my, my experience is very limited, but it seems like there's more of an emphasis on the other side is not just wrong, but is actually morally evil. Like the right thinks the left is morally reprehensible and and vice versa, you know? And and if you even align with the other side, then you too are complicit in moral evil. And it's like, Ooh, that's a dangerous, but like you said, is that kind of polarization? Do you think that is new? Or do you think that was always there at the beginning? Because the quote you read is pretty scathing, you know, like, (laughs) 
it is. Well, you can take that quote that, that Patrick read between Adams and uh, Jefferson and pull it right into today, where I just saw a few days ago that Pew Research came out with um, information where they'd ask Republicans and Democrats to describe each other. And what each said about the other is that they are lazy, unintelligent, immoral. What was another one? Uh, you know, this is this list of horrible things about each other. And when that's how you start labeling other people, well, then they're not good people you can work with to find the common good. They're the bad people that have to be defeated. And it feels like today, more than ever, we're able to live inside these bubbles where we really don't know people who are mm -hmm. different than us. Maybe yeah. it's people who have a different political party, but maybe it's people of different generations or races or, or whatever it is. And, and so when you don't know people, then you quickly fall for whatever you're told on social media or the traditional media about yeah. those people. Is that, do you and, think, you know, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, I, I just think of the, like the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't know each other because they lived in different villages, worshiped yeah. at different places, but they knew a lot about each other. Mm. And that was probably from town gossip or rumors or stories mm. that had been passed down from the years. And, and, and now we fall into that same trap where we're living like Jews and Samaritans in our own bubbles. Yeah. And, you know, so it's no shock that they were all offended at the parable of the Good Samaritan. I mean, how can there be a parable of the Good Samaritan when there aren't any Good Samaritans? <laughs> or it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a shock that they're uh, appalled that Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well because they didn't do that. I mean, they say to Jesus, we don't talk to people like that. Yeah. And it's easier and easier yeah. to do that now. And so we don't know people. We don't know that there's good people on all these sides and we can work together toward the common good, even if we don't agree yeah. on everything. I, I dare any preacher listening to preach a sermon if you're in a, like a strong conservative church the parable of the good democrat <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would be a hard a hard sermon to, to, to preach and i do think a lot of this really is about relationship and knowing real human people and the reason yeah. why i say that was is there's a study by the ANES the American National Electoral Survey i think is what that stands for but i i might have that wrong and, and every year they, they they measure extremity and, and polarization over policy issues and america was at its closest in 1984 there there was an extremity index of 0.44 so zero is you agree on everything one is you disagree on everything and they were at 0.44 which means Hey, you agree on more than you disagree on. We were at our most extreme differences in 2012 and it was at a 0.49. So still, even in 2012, which is when we were at our most extreme differences in policy disagreements, we agreed on more than we disagreed on. The number's actually gone down <laughs> since then, interestingly. And so what that highlights for me is that this, again, this is not really a debate over policy. It's not really, I mean, of course, that's part of it. That's what, that's what we fixate on. I think this is really more fundamentally about knowing human beings. Yeah. Do you have cross-cutting relationships with someone who has a different politic or a different political agenda than you do? And as America is increasingly geographically sorting into, you know, Republican enclaves yeah. and Democratic enclaves, it's now much, much, much more difficult to meet those kinds of people. And that's part of Keith and I's background. I mean, our city is a very uh, politically diverse city. So we just don't live in a circumstance where we're free to walk around as though someone from the other party doesn't exist there. Where are you guys at again? Are you in Kansas City? No. We're in Columbia, Missouri, which is right in the middle of the state. It's a blue dot in the middle of a, a sea of red. It's where the university is located. So it like Patrick said, it's it's pretty diverse place compared to most places in America. That so that um <clears throat> the 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 state's becoming more and more either blue or red. I is that new? Because I so I'm in Idaho. Idaho is very um, you know, red. And we're getting, we've always, Idaho has always had this kind of steady stream of Californians coming in. I'm one of them. Um, but now, <laughs> like almost everybody I meet from California, within seconds, they, they start talking politics and how they're fleeing, you know, this like horrible mm. state run by a horrible governor. And, oh, they, you know, they have their like, you know, Ben Shapiro mugs coming in and everything. And, um, <laughs> and I'm like. Leftist here. Yeah, the lefty. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, so, um, and I'm like. Me that not too long ago. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, is that, is that good? Like, is it, is it good that a state that's probably like 65, 70% red is not going to be 75, 80%? In the, I don't know. Like, is that, again, is that no. new? Is this kind of a, a new thing? And, and what's good? What's the, what's going to happen down the road when that keeps happening? Political scientists talk about landslide counties and a landslide okay. county is a county that won one of the sides, either blue or red, won the presidential election by 20 percent or more. 
So a landslide county that is a county that is decisively red or decisively blue. Mm -hmm. And just this past week in, in the uh, sermon, I was showing maps of how uh, the, in 1992, there were not many landslide counties. I mean, there were some throughout the United States, yeah. but not many, but with yeah. each election cycle, it's become more and more true that we all live in places where people think and vote like us. So now over 57% of Americans live in a landslide uh -huh. county. So it's easier to live in that bubble, but it's not just a neighborhood or county bubble. It's an online media bubble. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to live inside and talk to people yeah. who are like you. Yeah. And, you know, when we have that issue, then we're not going to know people. We believe lies and stories about yeah. them that aren't. true. We believe the worst about them. And, and we're just set up for failure. Yeah. yeah. And it does. Yeah. It feels like we've gone through a, a number of watershed moments in the last six years, the 2016 election, and, and then probably even worse than that, the 2020 election. But I think what made 2020 unique was that it came on, you know, not the tail end, but kind of in the middle of a pandemic where people were literally physically separated from one yeah. another. And yeah. so your ability to know someone who is different than you or voted differently than you was impeded by things that were totally out of your control because you're stuck at home, you're, you're not going out into public. And so, of course, your, your close circle is most likely to agree with you on those things. But I think you add in one other element into this little cocktail that's already just, just a very, very intoxicating cocktail, and that's social media. Yeah. Because yeah. these algorithms really are designed to force you into echo chambers. There's some interesting studies that have been done to see how long it takes uh, someone who, who starts maybe an account on YouTube with no IP address, no background, nothing. How long, how many videos they have to watch before they get sucked into a conspiracy theory, before the algorithm <laughs> takes them down the rabbit hole? And it would shock you. It would shock you how quickly this happens, especially on places like YouTube, on places like TikTok, uh, Facebook, all of these algorithms are designed to give you things that keep you on their platform. And as it turns out, mm -hmm. outrage, anger, hating yeah, the other yeah. side, that's one of the most effective ways to do it. And, and so it, again, if they want you to be on their platform, that's what they're going to serve you. And they'll keep giving you worse and worse and worse stuff. And so now you're stuck at home. You're in the middle of a, a very, very contentious presidential election. You're, you're, you're living a highly online life. I mean, is it any shocker that, you know, the, the, the net sum or the, the result of all of this is a heightened tribalism that yeah. we really haven't recovered from my um, my Instagram? I, I typically watch on Instagram if I if I get lost in Instagram, I either watch surfing videos or uh, otter videos. <laughs> so now I get all these like, cool advertisements <laughs> like. <laughs> buy an otter like <laughs> or like all these surfing like you know go surf in costa rica and all this stuff and it's like ah oh, that's great but i can only imagine if somebody starts clicking on e even start peeking into the door of some kind of like tribalistic thing which is probably what a lot of people do on social media right they actually instead of watching otters they're watching you know their political stuff and uh, yeah I, that does that makes complete sense sense and and this has been shown over and over right i mean the net netflix video what's the um the social Dilemma. Social dilemma. It's so well known. Why are why are we still doing it? Like we we know we're being used. Like that's just <laughs> I mean, not even debated like anymore. It, it's yeah. It's it, there, there's no shocker. You know, to, to to misquote Psalm 139, the algorithm has searched you and known your anxious <laughs> thoughts, and it has delivered you more anxiety to keep you on the platform. I mean, it's it's it's, it's their business model, and, yeah. and, and so there's again, there's no shocker here that that's what's happening to us. You know, what what I try to do is I I try to scramble the algorithm. So as a rule, I click on ads I'm not interested in, and I have now got Twitter convinced that I am a uh, geriatric woman who's very interested <laughs> in Medicaid. I mean, the amount of Medicaid uh, ads, like, you know, help you sort out your Medicaid situation I get is really, it's always these like old women fanning themselves with dollar bills. So I, I don't know why that's the thing, but I mean, I, 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 that's what I get now, you know, yeah. but most people aren't trying to scramble the algorithm. In fact, they're, they're just not even aware of what's happening when they're on the internet or if they are aware of it, they're, they're, they're not combating it actively. Yeah. So do you think, I mean, the, so, the social, Social media has been the gasoline on on the fire of tribalism. That is that 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 is unique, right? I mean, that's that yeah. adds a whole new added piece to the the tribalism that has always existed. You know, um, 
Yeah. I mean, in, in our book, we talk about a number of causes. We, we talk about social media and, and when we wrote it, it, it was, it was pretty uh, new thinking, but now that the wall street journal has done a lot of investigation into meta and all of its, uh, various organizations that it runs, more people are aware of what's happening there. Right. Um, we talked about some, we're talking about in terms of geographical sorting and social capital, the fact that we have less social capital, we, we are less wealthy in human relationships today than we were 50 years ago. Okay. That's another major cause. We don't trust each other. We talk about how the human brain is why wired for tribalism that, you know, no one can escape their wiring. There's something fundamental about how our brains are wired that makes us tribal. We also talk about what I mentioned earlier, which is the loss of capital T truth. So I think there's all of these facets and features coming together in a single moment to create where we're at. Yeah. Do you draw on uh, Jonathan Haidt's work? Because he talks about this a lot, that we're hive-ish creatures, you know, like, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we, 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 we pull a ton from Jonathan Haidt in the chapter about the human brain and, and a lot of the researchers that he's pulling on. Okay. Oh, I mean, there's so many interesting things to talk about. Like one, one of my favorite ones is uh, oxytocin, you know, so people yeah. might recognize that it's a love drug, you know, so when a mom sees her infant, oxytocin is released in the brain of both of them, you know, and that's what they feel love. They feel connection. They feel empathy. It's what you feel if you see your lover. Um, it's what you've lost if your relationship feels dry. Uh, and so people thought, well, that's a solution. We can end tribalism by just pumping oxytocin into the water stream. We're all going to become more empathetic over time and care for each other more. There, there, there we can solve the problem. Uh, but a, a, a psychologist named Karsten DeDrew, I think at Leiden University, did this study where uh, he sprayed uh, oxytocin into two groups' nostrils. and uh, Sorry, one group's nostril, and there was a control group. And, and what he discovered was the group that had the oxytocin, they were more, sacrific more sacrificial to their in-group members. So they were willing to give to each other. They were willing to care for each other. They were more empathetic than the group that didn't get the oxytocin. So, hey, it's working, right? There was just one problem. The same group that got the oxytocin became more tribalistic towards outsiders. Oh, they they were God. suspicious of outsiders. They, 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 they wanted to do harm to outsiders when they were given the option. And so, yes, it's the love drug, but it turns out it's also the tribal drug. Um, oh, wow. and, and so, you know, I, I kind of think about this in a Genesis three way, you know, God designed us to be a part of a huge, uh, human family. And he gave us this innate ability with chemicals and everything else to connect and empathize with one another. But when we redefined good and evil, we created this darkened version of that empathic capacity. And that is tribalism. And that's why, you know, we're living east of Eden. Like there's no shock that that's why, you know, humans are going to be just by default tribalistic. You, you guys, so. I mean, and, and this is, it's one thing to kind of look at our society we're living in, you know, look at Babylon and, oh, this, this sucks for you, you know, but the, it's so seeped into the church, obviously that that's, that's, yeah. that's where my main burden is. If I was, you know, living in exile in Babylon and Babylon had these, all this exacerbation tribalism, I'd be like, wow, that's interesting, you know, I'll grab some popcorn, but it's like now all the exiles are played into it and they're picking Babylonian tribes or whatever. Um, have you guys... How have you guys addressed that? Because because I've heard you say that, I mean, your church is very politically diverse. I mean, if I would I would imagine your podcast is probably resonating with the people you're, you know, at your church and everything on some level. So what, what's the what's the secret sauce to, to helping the to helping wean the church off of tribalism? If there is. Well, I'm not sure we have the secret sauce, but I will say <laughs> I will say that we share your heart in that the church is experiencing the same fracturing that we're seeing all around us. And more and more people are leaving their church, not yeah. over theological issues oh, or yeah. over maybe bad leadership. Although of course there are situations like that, but they're leaving their church to go find a church that says what they want to hear. Right. Because yeah. unfortunately more and more people are being discipled by, uh, you know, the internet, or they're being more influenced by the sermons of, of Tucker Carlson than they are by the Sermon on the Mount, or they're more influenced by the pages of the New York Times than they are the, the pages of scripture. Mm -hmm. And people have said for a long time, look, churches get people for such a, a, a small amount of time compared mm -hmm. to their other influences in their life. But I think that the church has to speak on these issues. You can't shy away because while the I get why pastors want to, I mean, we're pastors. I totally get why you just want to avoid it and ignore it. But those people out there in your congregation are all being shaped by something. And by the time it comes to you, to your door, well, you can't ignore it anymore. It's going to blow up.
And I think that's why a lot of pastors are, are worn out. They're exhausted. You know, we've seen the articles in Christianity Today and other places of pastors resigning or wanting to resign if, if they could afford to resign, yeah. burnt out, exhausted. It's not because they don't love what they're doing and feel called to pastor churches and do the things that pastors have done for thousands of years. It's because they're tired of being told that they have to parrot, you know, whatever political pundit is is mm-hmm. the, the person's rooting for. It, it's just... It, gets old. It, it's it's discouraging when you think about what you're saying. Like pastors have people, that, or the church has people for a couple, few hours a week, maybe, or a few hours a month. You know, um, versus all these other hours that they're just you know soaking in all this stuff. How do you do? Like, what? How do you combat that? I mean, do do you just talk explicitly and help people like over and over, like help disciple Christians in maybe a healthy view of? social media or is it like, how do you combat that? It just seems like a impossible situation. Sometimes, to some extent, it, it's not something that we can equal out, at least not immediately. But one thing right. we've tried to do is engage online. So oh, we've, okay. we've said, Hey, if our people are going to be in digital spaces and if they're going to be influenced by things, then let's get involved in those. Let's don't retreat. So we start several podcasts. We've got newsletters that go out, blog posts, social media posts, reaching out to different people with their in their audience, with the, their interests and trying to shape and form them. So we can all sit around and complain about the phone in our pocket. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, if we want to complain about that, I'll be the first in. I'll, there's a lot of legitimate complaints, but it's the world we live in. So why don't we take that device and use it for discipleship purposes? Why don't we try to flip the script a little bit and use it for the good, the good of Christ's kingdom, the good of people's spiritual health? And so that's what we've tried to do. You know, I'm sure other churches have taken other approaches and maybe we'll get to heaven and find out they were right. I don't know. We just know that we have to be faithful in our generation uh, not not the past generation, not a future generation, our generation. And in our generation, people carry this phone around, and we're going to be engaged in that medium with the message of Christ and his kingdom. Do, do you guys, um, like if somebody posts something on Facebook that just is not really healthy, maybe it's very tribalistic or, or kind of like demeaning towards the other tribe, or like do you, do you engage in that comments? Like do you go in and say and try to shepherd them through that or is it you just more like you said like putting out content podcasts blogs or are you like actively commenting on their on their posts or whatever <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a fantastic question and uh, it's it's honestly probably a little bit of both again what, what keith is saying that we want to be faithful in our generation i i i think that it's fine to just get online and publish and project and put information out there. And that's going to help people. So I don't want to wrong that, but I do think that there are relationships that can form online. I do think that people in, you know, not the same way that you do face to face, but that people can be shepherded and cared for online. And so, you know, when people come to us with what strikes us as sincere engagement and they can really dislike what we say and they can be really offended by it. But if it's sincere, they want to have a dialogue. We try best as we can to engage with them charitably. And, you know, in some cases that that produces a really fruitful dialogue. I mean, we we have people listen to our podcast who message us regularly and say, I hate what you said on this, but I really love your podcast. And to me, that's, that's a net win because now we're in a conversation with each other. Yeah. And now we're actually dialoguing about these important issues. And chances are we got something wrong. So I, I have something to learn from you. And obviously you're listening to me if you're listening to the podcast. And so I do think that part of online life, if you want to do it in, in a kind of native way, is actively engaging with you. And I'll be, I'll be the first person to say that's really, really hard to do charitably. Yeah. Um, I fail as many times as, as I succeed. Uh, but I, I do think that building relationships matters. I had, I had a pastor a while ago, I think this is maybe pre-pandemic or, or maybe at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, he said, you know, um, I had to stop looking at people in my church. I had to just stop looking at their posts because I like them in person. That church, they're like all oh, delightful and everything. And I'll see them on social media. And it's like this, this beast comes out, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'd rather just not know that. And I really resonate with that. But then now hearing you guys, I'm like, well, wait a minute, which one's the real person, the smiley plastic Christian at church or the one who's like ripping on <laughs> Democrats or Republicans or mask or no mask, whatever on social media. It's like, well, I wonder if there's a whole huge area of dis- discipleship needs here that aren't going to address because you're just kind of ignoring it. And yet at the same time, I, 
if I was a pastor, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm not going to go scour people's social media posts. But maybe we should. Like you said, that 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 is a huge part of people's rhythm of life, right? That that is That might be more the real them than the church them. I'm just thinking out loud here. This is kind of. Yeah, it's kind of scary to think that way because we all (laughs) know that put behind uh, uh, an anonymous Twitter account or put behind a screen where you don't see another human being in front of you that we're all capable of saying snarky, you know, things that probably wouldn't say to a real person in their face. But kind of going back to something you were saying about being shaped by media, it reminded me of this story that after George Floyd's murder, uh, you know, that was that first week after that. And nobody really knew exactly what happened other than we'd all watch yeah. this horrible video. And uh, we were getting hit up on Facebook that Sunday morning saying, you must talk about this or we're not coming back to your church. Well, we don't plan on talking about it, but as we say, we're, we're talking about it because we're honoring the lamb, not because we're talking about the donkey or the elephant's perspective. Yeah. But we were going to mourn and lament this tragic thing that the whole country went through watching yeah. it. Uh, and and so then right after we have that service, we get hit up by people on the right saying, oh, so now you believe that all police are racist. Right? <laughs> well, well, no, we never said that. But what they're doing is they're interpreting the worship service through the lens of their political tribes. Yeah. Or here's here's a similar thing that happened right after that is that uh, I get an email from a guy in our church, great guy, who says, hey, I'm uncomfortable with kind of the social issues that we're starting to pray about in church, the language we're using. And I was like, well, I don't quite understand. Can you just give me an example? And he said, yeah, like we're praying for justice and oppression and and I said, oh, okay, hang on. I, I told him, go to BibleGateway.com and just look <laughs> up those two words for me and put them in the search bar. And he emails me back and he's a great guy. He emails me back and he's like, oh, it's everywhere. And here are my favorite ones. And, and oh, I'm wow. like, yeah, these, these are, when we're talking about oppression and justice, those are biblical terms, biblical categories. So he was reading the worship service, the prayers, the liturgy, all that through the lens of cable news yeah. networks, right? Yeah. Well, that's the wrong glasses to put on, right? And so we're having to reverse that way of thinking and help people see that Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of love, justice, mercy, mm-hmm. that Jesus cares about human relationships. He cares about our our politic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so we've got to pursue justice and we've got to pursue mercy and we've got to work on behalf of the oppressed, mm-hmm. not because we're Republicans or Democrats, but because we're Christians. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I'm not, that happened. Yeah. Gosh. I mean, justice in the race conversation, I feel like it, it got so politicized that Christians just stopped looking at their Bibles and just read the conversation <laughs> through the lens of whatever, political you know talking point they were interested in whether it's like are you for crt or against it it's like is that the first question we should be asking like what is <laughs> what does the bible say about ethnic reconciliation it says a whole lot like let's start there and let that be our lens and do, do you see things getting better or worse or like what's <laughs> if, 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 well, unfortunately for us, we, we run a podcast about tribalism. So the worse tribalism gets, the better we do. Uh, <laughs> so our, our incentives are not well aligned, but uh, it does it does seem like it's getting worse uh, at, at yeah. the present moment. Now, I have hope that things c- can get better. You know, Jesus is always working. We know how the story ends. So I'm, I'm not living in anxiety or fear about those things. Uh, but I do think that the answer is the stuff that Keith's talking about, which is we have to talk about those issues. I mean, I, I don't know what your take is, Preston, on, on the seeker sensitive movement. Um, I think there are lots of good things, a desire to bring people into the church who weren't going yeah. to church. Um, but one of the things that happened because, you know, that movement was trying to draw in big crowds of people. I mean, the measure of success was church growth. That was the main thing because they're trying to do that. They had to be inoffensive. You know, so, right. so, so politics or anything ethical was off the table right, <laughs> because right. that was going to push people away. And so the sermons became very individualistic, very therapeutic. You know, let's work on your conflict management, your parenting, your communication skills, those kinds of things. Uh, but, but talking like you said about race, mm-hmm. we're talking about 
gender or talking about these major political issues, you know, that was, you know, escorted to a safe room in the back where, you know, Jesus could stay quiet and have nothing to say. And I think the unintended consequence of that movement was that it thinned out discipleship yeah. And, and people, because they got thinned out on those issues, look, the mind of Boer is a vacuum. So, so they were going to get filled up somewhere else. And they started getting filled up, you know, in the early days on cable news and now on social media. And so it's not a shocker that that where we're at right now as a church is churches full of people who think that the Bible doesn't talk about any of these issues. Right. I mean, I, I have stories just like Keith. I was talking to a woman not too long ago who was, again, offended that we were talking about racial issues. And she looked at me and she said very seriously, but very, very confidently, the Bible's you, you need to preach the gospel gospel. The Bible says nothing about race. Oh my God. You, you, you should, you, you need to focus on what you focus on. <laughs> and, you know, I had to kind of sit there with through gritted teeth because I thought, well, you're fantastically confident. You're also fantastically wrong right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and so th- it just illustrates the point. This is a wonderful church lady who's been a part of a church for a long time. And she really honestly thought the New Testament has nothing to say about mm-hmm. racial reconciliation or ethnic divisions. And so again, that, I'm just, I'm underlining, I think that's the problem. And the solution is we have to start talking about those things biblically. Paul talks more. I, I did a, um, if you add up the word count, Paul spends more ink on ethnic reconciliation and ethnic tensions than he does on justification by faith. <laughs> just, just, I'm not, and I'm just saying adding up the word count means it's more important or whatever. It's just like, no. it's kind of shocking to people. How, wait, I want to know how you quantified that. Like what, what were the words you were looking oh, I for? Did, I didn't actually. Okay. So I didn't actually add up the Greek words. It was more like okay. just the length of the passages. Like if you stack all the passages, you know, I mean, I mean the, the, the book of Ephesians, obviously chapter two, but even, I mean, chapter three into chapter four, I mean, the whole book of Ephesians is uh, largely about reconciliation across differences, even in the household mm-hmm. codes toward the end and everything. And, but, um, ethnic reconciliation is lives at the heart of that and paul lingers on that for for a while you know um you have the book of acts chapter 10 to 15 is pretty much all about ethnic divisions the book of galatians large chunks of romans i mean it's mm-hmm. it's it's a huge i mean it was it was one of the main things that the whole like jew gentile conversation in the first century and and you bring in the samaritan thing with the life of christ and the ethiopian union i mean it's just it's This is not a subsidiary theme, you know, but it's it does show that. And this is true of all of us. There is no view from nowhere. We do come at scripture. So our our lenses are just really fogged up with our upbringing, our culture, ethnicity, our our the time we're living in, you know, and like we just Mm. there's things in scripture that we just don't see because we're just programmed not to, not to see it. So that late, I mean, I was, I was that church lady that was like, the Bible says nothing about it. I remember, I mean, it was probably like maybe 15 years ago when I started seeing this, I was already halfway through seminary and I was like, Oh, this ethnic thing is kind of in the Bible, you know? Like, so yeah, I don't, I don't fall. That's just, that's just true of human nature. I think we're, what we need to do is expose people to that, that we all have lots of blind spots coming into, coming into the text. But, um, yeah, yeah. You're pressing- uh, I agree that 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 this is something I came to way way too late, embarrassingly too late in my uh, Christian life. Uh, I I was kind of a hyper individualist that mm. was thinking about me and God and can we yeah. get souls into the kingdom and let's get out of here and get up to heaven and all things <laughs> that have some elements of truth to it but are clearly less than biblically faithful. Uh, but I, I'm curious because as I've listened to your podcast, yeah. I've heard you have conversations with people. And I, I think, although I might be putting words in your mouth, that, that you kind of come from a in, a in a Baptist kind of perspective where yeah. you have rejected uh, empire. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, there's a lot that could be said for that. But I'm yeah. curious of how you think about Christians engaging mm. in the politic of Jesus, Jesus's kingdom. You know, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. So should we be working toward bringing that kingdom? And if we do, doesn't that involve mm. uh, civic, public, political involvement to some extent? And how do you think about that? Do you Do you think Christians should be engaged in that or do you think we should – kind of reject the empire and follow Christ separately from that public engagement. Yeah, that's a good, honestly, I don't, I don't have a, an ironed out answer to that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I could think out loud with you and I might change my mind tomorrow on, on like where to draw the line. I, I would lean m- much more on, on the Anabaptist. And I wasn't ready. I mean, I, 
I didn't know what Anabaptist was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm coming at it from a conservative reform kind of perspective. Um, so I sometimes call myself a, ref, you know, reformed Anabaptist, which makes me about one of like six in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even, even my reform kind of theology is very, very low, lowercase r reformed, you know, uh, I, I don't know, check off a lot of the traditional boxes there, but yeah, yeah, I, um, I, I do. I guess there's kind of two perspectives. One would see the nations as kind of, you know, God ordained, um, the Romans 13, you know, God works a lot of good through the, through the nations, through political entities, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, um, good citizens of Babylon and, and, and pray for the city and be engaged in the city and work for the good of the city. That That is a theme. It's also countered with, you know, the book of revelation where you have, and the the beast is empowered by the dragon you know the beast is you know the political entity of the day and and kind of symbolic of all political entities and that the kingdom of god has a distinct politic that runs counter to other political entities even if they overlap i mean rome made adultery illegal it was illegal to commit adultery what well, great but it's still like we can agree with that we can agree there was um I mean, Caesar Augustus was actually very conservative in many ways. Well, he there, there's was he really? But I mean, he, there, there's there's there was values in the Roman Empire that might have overlapped with Christianity and other ones that conflicted. Um, but it's still it's still <laughs> it's still empowered by the dragon, you know. So I I I do think that, and again, I'm still thinking out loud, you know, about where the line is, does that mean that Christians shouldn't be involved in Babylon's politic at all? I, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just, I wouldn't want to invest faith in that kingdom in bringing good in the world. I would want to do it as the kingdom of, of God. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little more open to, I, I'm a little more, um, suspicious of like kind of national politics mm -hmm. as bringing as something Christians should invest in local political stuff. You know, I, I, um, a neighbor of mine came and he lives on a street, the speed limits 20 and people ripped down his street at 40, 50. Actually, I'll, I ripped down his street at 40, 50 miles an hour. It's a big <laughs> road. It's a country road. It's like, why is the speed limit 20? Anyway, he's, you know, it's not getting a petition to get speed bumps put in. I'm like, oh, I hate, oh. you know, but I'm like, ah, he's got kids and everything. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know? So like trying to try, like that, that is, is a level of kind of local politics or whatever that I think I, I could see more. And there's other people like Caitlin Sheese and others who have, who have kind of argued for, you know, there, there's a lot more maybe um, hope for uh, getting involved on more of a local political level than getting mixed up in kind of the national stuff. But I'm not a political scientist. I mean, I'm again, take my right. word of the grain of salt. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out theologically, like what is a Christian political identity living in the midst of empire and the nations, and is America similar to the same as or very different from you know the the satanically empowered beast of the first century you know and i really don't know if i have clarity on that do you what do you guys what do you guys think yeah feel free to push i mean i could you guys seem like you're way more politically knowledgeable than i am on 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 that side of things so well i agree that, that there's a lot of tension and obviously this is something the church has debated for for centuries and yeah. there's a reason because it's not super clear like on one side you have what you said that the beast but on the other side you've got uh daniel and Joseph yeah. working their way up in these foreign pagan right. governments. So there's a lot of data that we have to take into account. We can't just separate out the ones that support our opinion. Right. But talking about local stuff interests me also because I just saw an article in Christianity Today. I don't know if it's an article or an opinion piece. I'm not sure how it would be qualified in which the person writing it said that Christians just need to stop running for school board. And so, you know, I asked the question about what's your thought about Christians engaging in politics. And then you kind of took it to the local place, but that's sometimes where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And so I, I'm afraid that, well, maybe I play my cards too much, but, but I'm afraid that, that w we as Christians are going to say, look how ugly and demeaning yeah. 
dehumanizing and embarrassing to the church our political involvement has been. So let's just back away. Let's pull away, mm -hmm. stay pure over here, kind of go the Essene route, you know, where we're going to stay yeah. pure in our, our uh, tribe, and we're not going to get dirty with all that. But but I think it's a fair critique to say that God cares about justice, which I know you agree with, and, yeah, and so yeah. does the writer of that Christianity Today article. They agree with that. Uh, so how can we pull away and yet work for justice? I mean, w during the civil rights movement, uh, sure. yeah. Christians yeah. needed to get engaged right. if we were going to have just uh, laws. And, and so are there just laws that we need to be pursuing now yeah. on behalf of the oppressed or on behalf of the poor or that, that reflect racial or sexual ethics or life or, you know, all kinds yeah. of issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm a, I'm a, like I said, I'm a little bit afraid that we're going to pull back and say, well, let's, let's stay clean and pure. And I understand that I want to do that. And I get it, but I don't think that's Jesus's solution. Yeah. If he's teaching us, pray, may your kingdom come, your will be done. That That's a great, and yeah, the example of the school board, like right when he said that, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, th I think it would be good for Christians to be on school boards and be involved in public school. I guess I, I do get, for me, it's like, well, what are we trying to do? Um, Like, are we trying to bring back prayer in schools or something? It's like, but we live in a, secular democracy democratic nation so like prayer in schools means like you should be all for uh the muslim teacher praying you know out five times a day at school or whatever like prayer in school doesn't mean christian prayer in school or are we trying to bring a christian sexual ethic in the school or just make it to where christians with a sexual ethic cannot be shamed or demeaned or whatever you know so what what are you and so my, i guess my fear is sometimes in the past at least when christians are getting politically involved they seem to be kind of trying to using secular means of power to ram through kind of a christian ethic and that's where it gets me nervous um and understandably yeah. so i totally get it. and when you get into the middle of those conversations on your local school board or right. wherever it is that you're a part of it, it gets really messy and unfortunately it's not really wow clean cut. And then there are yeah. people like, us oh, we'll take you on your podcast and criticize you for whatever you do, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, but like, um, for example, here in our own local community, the school board recently approved the, uh, the, the creation of a, a gender closet where people could come to school, students could come to school and switch out clothes that they wore of, so that they could take on the clothes and the, the appearance of a different gender mm -hmm. and then wear those during the school and return them. And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons behind that, and I don't pretend to know them all, so I'm not probably not giving it a, yeah. a fair shake. But it's pretty easy to see that part of that is to keep it from parents. And so should the school board yeah. be advocating for the creation of this closet that yeah. at least one of the purposes is to keep this information from parents? Now, if you are a Christian and you're on that school board, is it wrong to say, no, I don't think you should do this. And my faith is part of what informs that decision. Mm -hmm. Or is that ramming, like you said, is yeah. that ramming uh, my Christian views through with political power? Well, people are going to have different opinions on that. It's not going to be an easy question yeah. to answer. No, that's, t that's, that's, no, that's, that's, uh, there definitely is a messy tension there. Um, I almost, Yeah. Yeah, rather than ramming, trying to ram a Christian ethic, because even even like that, like I, if I wasn't even a Christian, I, I I I can say I'm concerned about that. Just from natural law morality, sure. maybe. I mean, maybe, and that example is messy for several reasons. But um, anytime the school's trying to do something to like, like. Dis for lack of better terms, disciple your kids for you and, 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 and be suspicious of parental rights over your kids. Like that, that's just a bad policy in general. Like I don't need to be a Christian to say that that's probably not good or, or some of the stuff being taught in schools. I mean, you can go down the long list and, and I know the right likes to highlight some of the, you know, libs of TikTok stuff, you know, but <laughs> as if it's like happening everywhere, but it is obviously happening somewhere. And it's like, yeah, that those, the, some of these things are, really disturbing and and um do we do we address those as a christian or simply as a <laughs> good citizen who says this is not good for a democratic free society or is or is it a both end i, I don't know I mean, these, what do you 
<laughs> I think I mean I think I think this is a, a great example and obviously we're not going to come to to the answer but I mean we are saying there's different angles into this we could talk about it in terms of our faith we could talk about it like you said in terms of natural law you know subsidiarity the notion that actually a, a, a parent uh has more, not just more authority, but they, they, they get to see the whole horizon of a child's life, <laughs> whereas teachers have them maybe for a school year. So so maybe we should trust parents to uh, love and care for their kids more than teachers right. do, although I love teachers. But I, I also wonder if if maybe this is a little bit of a both and. I mean, yeah. the, the Bible yeah. doesn't give us a clear answer. Sometimes we are going to be in a kind of antagonistic relationship towards the powers that be because they are being animated by the dragon. Other times we're going to be in uh, situations where we might have to compromise, like you said, Daniel or, or Joshua. And each circumstance is almost like an improvisation. You know, we have to know the scale in our heads. Like we have to know, like these, these are all the notes that fit into C major. And these are, you know, so, so I can play a song in this scale, but it's up to us to improvise in the moment what it is. And I know for me, because I'm actually probably more like you, Preston, I, I, I kind of like the idea of uh, Reformed with a lowercase r and a little bit Anabaptist. Oh, that sounds right. We should start, start a start, church start, together. Start There'll be start seven people bit, there. Bit. <laughs> um, but part of that for me just comes down to as a Christian, I need to live loosely with regards to the political structures that be, because I know that at times they can be a means of loving my neighbor and, and God accomplishing his will on earth. But there are so many other means in the politic of Jesus of accomplishing those same things that I can't limit it to those things. And that's right. the problem with the fixation on federal politics, as though what happens in Washington is going to shape everything that happens in my city. And why I like what you said about saying, well, let's focus locally because we actually might have a lot more power to create change where we're at than than we could do or than we could have in Washington. So again, I, I think for me, I, I, I just, I, I want to be loose to those things. I don't want to over rely upon those things. I don't want to overemphasize their importance. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge that the spirit works through all kinds of networks, not just political networks. And if I can say all those things, you know, I get a little less uh, agitated when I'm watching the, you know, large scale national conversation. I also, here's another thing too. Like I, um, I almost want to say like before we even talk about how individual Christians should be involved in the politics of the day, I, I want to say it is the kingdom of God embodying the, the ethics, the, the polis, the, the, the society that we are wanting the greater society to have. Are we embodying a healthy perspective on sexuality and gender? Are we embodying kingdom economics where there is no poor among us because everybody's being cared for are we embodying ethnic reconciliation like are our churches mirroring the ethnic vision of the bible almost before <laughs> and it's not an either or it's a both and but i mean i i do i do think the priority should be uh, us focusing on the church and making sure we're embodying the very polis the kingdom that we're wanting the the secular kingdom to maybe um reflect on some level. And, I, and if, yeah. if, if we go that route, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have so <laughs> much work to do. We have um, a ton to do. We we had uh, Tim Mackey on our podcast. I, yeah. I think that will be out by the time this airs. And we were talking about Ephesians and, and the message of ethnic re reconciliation. Yeah. And of course, evangelicals are really good at the vertical part, like Jesus yeah. reconciled. We love the God. first we're part of Ephesians too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's almost Ephesians too. That's exactly right. It's like, which half of the chapter do you want to <laughs> emphasize? And I want both. Uh, but Tim said something in that podcast that's really st st stuck with me. And he said that throughout the book of Ephesians, uh, it's clear that the structures of the church, how the church lives, how the how the church acts, is a witness against the structures of evil in the world. And so that's a great what, phrase. He, what he's trying to say is, look, when you look at the church, you need to see something different. And when you see things happening there that can't happen anywhere else, it proves that there's something different, that there yes, is a Messiah yeah. and a king who's reigning over them who is not Caesar. So when you look at a church that has politically and ideologically diverse people worshiping alongside one another, uh, ethnic diversity, and of course, that's going to be different depending on the demographics of your city and, and, and where you live, but has uh, an ethnic diversity that's hopefully somewhat representative of your city. But when you when you see a church like that and, and they're able to get along and love one another and care for one another in a way that our world can't, everybody's going to notice. <laughs> everybody's yeah, going to yeah. pay attention. When they see a church that's generous in, 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 in its giving to people both inside and outside the church, again, people are going to notice because that's not how the world functions. And so I, I'm, I'm with you. We, we need to be a witness inside the church that, that the structures of the world aren't working, they can't be relied upon, and that the structures that the spirit forms inside of our body politic, that they do work. And it, yeah, I, I do like the idea. I mean, it, it, the ideal situation would be a church imperfectly, but, you know, pursuing uh, 
you know, embodying kingdom values um, in the church. And, and ideally, it'd be awesome if that sort of almost spilled over into the community, that a church is just killing it with ethnic reconciliation so that when there were unjust laws or racial stuff in the city, that the church is not speaking out of both sides of its mouth, like being so angry at that. And yeah, they have all kinds of racial stuff going on that they're not even a- addressing, you know, it, it kind of like, <laughs> you know, when, when Christians got all up in arms or, or are all up in arms with CRT, it's like, I really hope this isn't the first time you kind of were publicly concerned about a racial conversation. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> wait, CRT? No, it's like, as long as you've been pursuing racial reconciliation in your church forever, you know, th- th- then, you know, maybe you have some credibility to voice that kind of external concern. I guess that, that again, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. I haven't, I've have not ironed this out, but I mean, I, th- I think that would be maybe more helpful. And, and again, as long as whatever, whatever good we're trying to um, pursue in, in Babylon's ethic, as long as we do throw, do so not through, the power structures of Babylon or, um, and I, I, I use the phrase, you know, ram through something, but like, but really like we're supposed to do so in humility. We're supposed to love our enemy and neighbor regardless, you know, always. Right. And so as long as even our political involvement doesn't force us to kind of set aside our kingdom values, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all for that. Um, and I think, what again, the, I think I'm more optimistic of that happening on a local level than on a on a federal level. But I don't know. One yeah. of the things that's hardest, I think, for us as Christians is that anybody can call themselves a Christian. Anybody can put in their yeah. Twitter bio or their Facebook bio, whatever they want. And we as pastors, leaders, we can't control what people say or do or how they act. And so yeah. it's hard for the church to have a reputation that is stellar in the community because all these people who can call themselves whatever they want, there's no gatekeeper to evangelicalism, right? I mean, yeah. if you if you say you're a, a Republican or a Democrat, then you have to register for those in most states. You have to commit yourself publicly to being one. Yeah. You have to be accepted in some sense by the party, but you don't do that as a church. Anybody can call themselves a Christian. So if we're going to wait until the church gets its reputation cleaned up before <laughs> interacting on this, we're going to be waiting for a long time because from the very first century, the churches, they're pretty messy. And so yeah. it shouldn't surprise us that our churches are pretty messy. Yeah. But one of the yeah. things that you, you, you were talking about is, do we have a track record of being mm-hmm. generous and loving and kind? Yeah. And I, I, we tell this story in the book. There's a couple of them, uh, the thing that our church has done that has gotten our community's attention the most is that uh, on we've done a couple different campaigns where we've raised money. The first one was to pay off medical debt. Mm-hmm. And we started out just saying, we're going to try to pay off uh, medical debt in our own county. And we had this great partner called RIP Medical Debt. And they're not a Christian organization, but a great organization. And we worked with them to find people who are uh, struggling financially, and we were going to pay off their medical debt. And so we ended up, our church ended up raising $450,000, wow. like not over pledges, but just like that day, that week. And we paid off through RIP medical debt, $450 million in over 30 counties in our oh state, gosh. all the medical debt. And then we went, uh, the next Easter, we went and found out how many people are on the U- the the disconnect list through our utility department and the disconnect list is exactly what you think it is it's your utilities are all going to be disconnected and then people oh. have to move out and they can't find another apartment because they have this bill that they haven't paid to the city so so we just found out what that was and then we took it to our congregation and we raised another 400,000 plus dollars to pay off everybody on that list and then to give some of it to organizations that help people stay off that list and mm-hmm. and maybe never get on that list in the first place and th- those kinds of things they got our community's attention. Yeah. In other words, when we when we do inner squad things, when we help other Christian groups, no, it's not. It, it, those are great things, yeah. but nobody outside cares. The watching world says, "What will you do for the people who are different than you, or the people you don't know, or the people who are hurting?" And you know, we just try to make a point that when we paid that off, we we're paying off for white and black and Asian and Latino. We we're mm-hmm. paying off straight and queer and mm-hmm. everything in between. We were paying off everybody's debt that had a need. We didn't ask the question, you know, do you deserve this? Because Christ didn't ask us that question when he died for us and paid our debt. We just asked the question, who has the need? Let's help meet your need where you are. Do you, and, 
And so I think that kind of stuff gets our, 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 our community's attention. I, first of all, 110% absolutely love that. W- would you consider that political involvement? Like, would you, like, when you ask about how politically involved should Christians be, like, is, would you categorize that as political involvement or? Well, I'll, I'll say this and then Patrick jump in. I, I say when Jesus told us to pray, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. It's a kingdom of love, justice, and mercy. And so if we can bring love, justice, and mercy to our community in unconventional ways, yeah. then I think that's not the only way to do it, but it's one way to do it. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. Love that. I, I would want to say that's political. I mean, again, this goes back to redefining what politics are. We think of politics as the horse race, you know, that's happening in Washington. That's a horse race. That's not, I mean, it is politics. Things are getting, well, not right now. The legislators really don't legislate. Um, But where real politics happen uh, is, is, is on the ground in people's lives. Lee Camp, he's a professor at Lipscomb University. He has this definition of a politic. It's really, really good. And and it helps me say, yes, this is a politic. He says a politic is an all encompassing manner of communal life that grapples with all the questions the classical art of politics has always asked. How do we live together? How do we deal with offense? How do we deal with money? How do we deal with enemies and violence? How do we arrange marriage and families and social structures? How is authority how is authority mediated, employed, and ordered? How do we rightfully order our passions and appetites? How much more besides, and but especially at these, where is the human where is human history headed? What does it mean to be human? And what does it look like to live in a rightly ordered human community that engenders flourishing justice and the peace of God? Yes. Now that's your definition of a politic, which I yeah. think maps really closely into Jesus' most political sermon. <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. That's going to reorder what, 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 what you think matters. I mean, one of the problems with tribalism is that is that it orders the things that we think of as political. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to talk about race. We want to talk about gender. We want to talk about all the hot topics. And those are political things. But I think more fundamentally, what we're talking about, canceling people's debt <laughs> that yeah. is, you know, sad and broken them down, that, that is an incredibly political act. Serving at the local yeah. charity that's helping single moms or drug addicts or, you know, working at the halfway house, helping ex-cons come back into society. These are all really actually the political works that I think the church should be involved in. We'd be far better off if we fixated our money and energy there. Is is that from uh, Lee's book, Scandalous Witness? Yes, it is. When I read that book, I was sitting on my elliptical early one morning reading that book and I text Patrick like it. 4.30 4.30 in the morning, because we're both morning people. And I said, I just found your best book of the year, your favorite book. <laughs> okay. And and he, he hadn't heard of it, but he read it. And he, it is now my favorite book of that year. So, so yeah, good. I bet you'd like it too. You sounds like you've read it. I read it. Yeah, I read it a couple, right, right, I think right when it came out. Um, it's I, I need to go back and read it again. I remember just, yeah, I, reading it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a, because sometimes, and this is what I love about you guys, honestly, when I listen to your podcast, is sometimes when people have a, um, kind of a, oh, Christians shouldn't be partisan. Within seconds, it kind of seems clear that they do lean. They do kind of still value one political party more than the other, you know? And and I love that you guys really equally kind of point out, you know, areas in both, any kind of tribalism can can be problematic, you know? And and I felt lead to the same thing. I mean, you know, you read somebody, I was assuming it would feel a little more like left-leaning. And it might... But not, I don't know, like he, he really, I think anybody who put their allegiance in, in a party, in a party would feel uncomfortable in that book equally, you know, and that's what I really loved about it. Um, yeah, that yeah. there, there was, um, I forget whether it's the church was in Chicago or San Francisco, but they, they were in a, a, a neighborhood that was, had a lot of like LGBT people and they ended up as a ministry, um, just doing like free daycare. Uh, because it was an incredibly expensive area, people are you know working two jobs. But sometimes, sometimes daycare could cost like I don't know fifty grand a year or something. You know, they did free <laughs> wow. daycare, and knowing that like probably half of the people that were going to drop their kids off were going to be lesbian, you know, parents, and um, yeah, they, they they were doing good in society, serving people around them, and man, that just is so they're. they're their love for each other and their love for, you know, the church kind of spilled over into the neighborhood. And they said they had so many people that were like, I can't believe you're doing this is why would you do this for us? You know? And, and you know, the the lesbian parents were like, I looked at your website and I kind of cringe at some of your (laughs) statements on homosexuality, (laughs) but you're loving us more than I, this is crazy. So that, you know, they've shown up the church and, 
um, having great conversations. So yeah, I, I guess that when I, absolutely, I think the church, the church's embodiment of the kingdom of God should spill over and, and produce good in society. There's that famous statement. You guys probably know it. Um, was it from like a second century Roman leader? Like they're, you know, um, talking about Christianity, you know, they're, they're not only taking care of their own poor, but they're taking care of our poor. <laughs> right. Like that. I think that's the sweet spot right there. Yeah. And um, I think, I think that's um, the, that's the politic that we want. And yeah. you know, we're, we're yeah. lucky because we live in a relatively small city. It's 150,000 people. So mm-hmm. our ability to influence a city as sure. a decent sure. sized church is pretty tremendous, but I, I'm really not lying when I say this. And, and it's the thing that makes me most proud about the people who are part of our church, who, who are volunteers and working if you're a refugee and you come to Columbia and there's a lot of refugees who want to come to Columbia, there's a good chance the first person you'll meet is someone who goes to our church. Mm. If, if you are coming out of the prison system and you're trying to get acclimated back into society, there's a good chance that one of the first people you're going to meet is going to be a person at a church. In fact, there's a good chance that the first person to give you your first job out of prison is going to be a person at our church. Yeah. If you're, yeah. if you're a single mom or you're homeless and you need services to, to find housing for you and your kids, there's a good chance that the organization that you go to in our city, the first person you're going to talk to is going to be someone at our church. And that's why when you go to our church, I mean, our, our church, you know, by the world standards can, can look a little bit uh, shady because you walk around and you just see people from every socioeconomic yeah. bracket there. And they're largely there because someone loved them first. And they said, that's different. That showed me something I've never experienced before. And that draws them to Jesus. And I think of that as the kingdom politic. That yeah. is what doing politics yeah. in the kingdom way really looks like. It's not about who you voted for in, in the presidential election, as important as that may be. Well, yeah. and you were talking yeah. about Celsus who said, I think it was Celsus who said they yeah. don't yeah. take care of uh, their poor, but ours as well. And isn't that exactly how the Roman world came to faith in Christ? Just yeah. like Patrick saying that it's the Christians who stayed and we know these stories, but we've gotten away from them. It's the Christians who stayed and sacrificed during the plagues. It's the Christians who mm-hmm. cared for for babies that weren't their own. And instead, we've gotten wrapped up in trying to gain power. Yeah. And, you know, we want the most votes on the school board. We want the most seats on the Supreme Court. We mm-hmm. need to control the legislature. And I don't want to minimize any of those things because I'm all for bringing justice and and kindness and mercy and grace and God's kingdom, however we can. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's the school board and the Supreme Court and the legislature that has to wrestle with those issues. Mm-hmm. But we can only do that if we're also working alongside of people in their time of need or people trying to meet needs in our community, whether that's being a mayor and giving leadership to a community that brings people together who are different and who can work together for the common good or yeah. whether it's serving yeah. in a homeless shelter. We, we, we've we've got to have both of those. And if we don't, yeah. um, well, we're going to stay, stay stuck. What's what uh, what are you is your. Tell me about your church more. How, how big is it? What's your denomination? I hate asking how big, but it's just well, I'm trying to picture it. We started know? in 2000. <laughs> so we started with 35 people in a basement in 2000, and we've grown uh, substantially. Now, COVID has thrown everything uh, into a weird place, right? Sure. So uh, I'll tell you where we are today is that this past Sunday, we had about t- total people in the building, about 3,600 and oh, okay. probably about another 3,500 online. Okay. Uh, so that's, and, a, that's, a, that's, um, a big, that's a big church, especially for a city. It's a decent yeah. size church. Yeah, it's a decent size church. And what's your, yeah, are we, you guys co-pastors or what's the, what's your guys' role? Uh, <laughs> my friend Dave, who's older than me, he and I uh, started the church okay. a long time ago, okay. uh, back in 2000. And then Patrick became, you tell him your story. Yeah, I, I became a Christian at the crossing. I became a Christian when I was 19. And, and so uh, I, I've, I've had, this is the only church experience I've really had in any sort of long term sense is being at this church and then eventually came on staff in 2010, became a pastor. Um, and Keith and I, we, we do a lot of writing and projects together. We started podcasting. We together. share an office together. We share an office <laughs> together. So <laughs> we're, 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 we're a good tag team with, with one another. Um, but this is a church that, I mean, it, for me in a very very real way is is the reason why I'm walking with Jesus and following Jesus. So you know, I, I love it profoundly. Is People it part can of a denomination. Get uh, we are we're, we're part of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Uh, however, we always kind of say we're Presbyterian lowercase p. Uh, it's not it's not on the front door. You got to become a member to 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 find out that layer of secret what yeah. denomination we actually are. <laughs> um, but yeah, 
We think there's a good role for denominations and the EPC has been good and generous to us. It's just that most of our pastors, maybe all, we didn't come from Christian backgrounds. We became Christian in college students or a little bit later in life than, than your typical pastor. And so we don't have these allegiance to denomination like we grew up Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian or Baptist or whatever it is. So we are connected with the denomination. There's some really good things about that. But if you just walk in the door, you probably don't know that for quite a while. Where's the EPC on the sort of spec theological spectrum of like the OPC, PCUSA? <laughs> PC, <laughs> uh, the the PC USA, you know, back in the early seventies, the, the PCA split out of them, right? And so in seventy three, and then in I think it was eighty three, the EPC split out of them, and so what was the uh, issue? Well. Well, so there, there were multiple issues. PCA was, uh, this is this is a fun little history lesson. We should not be the people talking about this. I for <laughs> so, sure shouldn't be. I went to Trinity. He went to Covenant. So he got baptized in Presbyterian. Oh, you, okay, yeah. yeah. I'm a Trinity uh, guy. So. <laughs> no, just, just to make it simple, it, it, it was over, uh, in the PCA's case, the ordination of women. Uh, the PCA did not want to ordain women. Okay. There was a separation there. And then with the EPC, it, it was the PCUSA's position on uh, homosexuality. Okay. Uh, and the EPC. So, so you, like, as you put this thing on the spectrum, you know, you have like hyper conservative OPC, yeah. you know, next conservative is probably PCA. The EPC, I, I would describe as being moderate, but, but, but theologically conservative, you know, okay. so, so we, we, we don't at our church, but other churches have uh, female elders and, okay. and pastors. And so the thing I like about our denomination is, is that we, we, we are united on a lot of the central essential things. And there's a lot of space for uh, disagreements and different different practices outside of those, which, which I think is a, is a healthy way to manage, um, a diverse denomination. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds a lot like the ECC, the evangelical covenant church, where they're kind of right in the middle of kind of evangelical kind of convictions, uh, very heavy into like race conversation. They ordain, they do ordain women. They've been doing that long before it was, you know, <laughs> like a long time ago, but they, they're very orthodox and sexuality questions and stuff. Um, that's cool, man. Um, well, hey, I've, ta I've taken you guys, I didn't even realize the time, taking you over the hour that you promised to give me. But, uh, dude, I, yeah, I can keep talking to you guys for hours, but I'm going to have to just uh, close out and turn on your podcast and keep listening to you. So uh, just a reminder, so the, the book is Truth Over Tribe, Pledging Allegiance to the Lamb, Not the Donkey or the Elephant, which that title is pretty BA. I love that. Um, and the <laughs> podcast is, you have, wait, you have two podcasts, right? Truth Over Tribe. And then what's the other one again? 10 Minute Bible Talks. Ten Truth Over Bible. Tribe uh, comes out weekly and we have conversations with people and the uh, leaders across the nation or with each other about okay. uh, political topics. And 10 Minute Bible Talks is exactly what you think it is. It is 10 minute devotions led by Patrick and I or Tanya or Jensen, two of our other co-hosts. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for joining me. Really appreciate everything. Take care, Brenton. Right. Thanks for awesome. having us on. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network. Hey friends, I just want to invite you to consider joining the Theology Nara Patreon community. This is a group of followers who believe in the ministry and work of Theology Nara and want to support it financially. And honestly, I've been so impacted by the people who have chosen to support this podcast. Um, every month they send in a bunch of questions. A lot of them are really personal and I get to spend time responding to them in a private podcast. And we, you know, we'll message each other throughout the month and post responses to each other's questions. Um, I'm actually going to start something new this fall, a month live Zoom chat with some of the members. And I'm super looking forward to actually seeing more of their faces every month. And there's other perks to come up. Like, you know, they all get free, uh, a free virtual pass to the Theology and Exiles in Babylon conference every year. But honestly, I don't want to make it sound transactional. Every single Patreon member that I've talked to says the same thing. We like all the perks. Uh, we're thankful for them, but we're just more thankful to support the ministry of theology in the raw, and we're glad to do so. So if this is you, if you've been impacted by Theology in the raw, you can join the Theology in the raw community for a minimum of five bucks a month by going to patreon.com 
forward slash the Algin Ra. That's patreon.com forward slash the Algin Ra. Um, the link is in the show notes. 